So in previous lectures, we defined the stress and strain tensors, and we showed how they were used. Okay, uh, now what we want to talk about is the relationship between uh, stress and strain. And the relationship between stress and strain is called the constitutive law. And for a linear elastic material, which is going to be the focus of this lecture, the relationship between any stress component and any strain component is going to be constant. So we can write the following. We can say that sigma ij is equal to, uh, we'll say c i j k l epsilon k l, okay? Okay, where this c i j k l represents a fourth order tensor uh, that contains these constants that are the relationships, okay? And usually we call this the stiffness tensor. Okay, we could also write it um, with respect to the strain and say that epsilon ij is equal to, and then in this case we use a compliance tensor, sijkl, now times sigma kl, and we'll call these collectively equation 1, okay? This is also a fourth order tensor. In this case, we refer to this as the compliance tensor. So the fourth order tensors C and S, uh, they each contain 81 terms, right? That's just three to the fourth power, right? There's four uh, dimensions. Each one goes through one, two, three. That gives us 81, okay? But in this case, because of symmetry uh, in I and J, in K and L, and in swapping I, J, and K, L, the number of unique constants is reduced to 21, or independent constants, if you like. So if you want to model a generic material that's fully anisotropic, you need, uh, and it's linear elastic, you need 21 constants to describe the relationship between stress and strain in that material. Obviously, that's not the type of material that we usually work with. So for materials that are uh, isotropic, of course, we only need two elastic constants. Okay, and then in that case, uh, equation one can uh, be reduced to the following. Uh, in this case, we would just say that uh, sigma ij is equal to uh, lambda epsilon kk, uh, delta ij plus 2 mu times epsilon ij. Let's call that equation 2. You could write something similar uh, in terms of strain as well. Uh, in this equation 2, uh, lambda and mu, so where lambda and mu are what's called, are what's known as Lame constants. So these Lame constants can be related to the more familiar um, terms of elastic properties. So for example, uh, G, the shear modulus, is equal to mu. Okay, so that is the shear modulus. We can write down E, the Young's modulus, in terms of lambda and mu as just uh, mu times three lambda plus two mu divided by lambda plus mu. Uh, and of course we know in terms of g, this is equal to 2g times 1 plus nu, the Poisson's ratio, right? And this is defined as what we would call the Young's modulus, okay? And if we wanted, we could also write the Poisson's ratio nu uh, in terms of the Lame constants, and that would be lambda over 2 times uh, lambda plus mu, okay, and of course this is the Poisson's ratio. Okay, so we'll collectively call these equations three. So for anisotropic materials, um, the form of that uh, compliance matrix or stiffness matrix in tensor notation can become very complicated. So in this case, what we do is we, we use what's referred to as Voigt notation, uh, to represent equation one. So how do we do this? Well, the first thing we do is we observe that because of the symmetry in the stress and strain, right, 
each of these three by three tensors uh, can only have six unique terms. So what we end up doing is writing, um, instead of writing uh, tensors for stress and strain, we write stress and strain vectors. So let's take the stress vector. We'll write this as sigma with braces to indicate that it's a vector. And it's going to have six components, sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 2, sigma 3, 3, sigma 1, 2, sigma 1, 3, and sigma 2, 3. Okay, and we could write the strain vector in a similar fashion. Okay, the strain vector also has six terms. It's going to be epsilon 1, 1, epsilon 2, 2, epsilon 3, 3. And now this is going to be a little different. This will be gamma 1, 2, gamma 1, 3, and gamma 2, 3. Those are engineering shear strains, not the tensor uh, components specifically. So we'll call this equation 4. Okay, I'm going to make two notes about this. Here's one note. Okay, The order of those shear terms, the last three terms, uh, in each of these vectors, uh, it's it's a matter of convention, okay. And so what that means is it can differ from textbook to textbook. Okay. The other point I want to make, this other note, uh, is that the strain vector uses engineering shear strains, uh, gamma i j. Okay. So it uses engineering shear strains, not uh, the tensor shear strains, right? And you can remember that they're related, gamma i j is equal to 2 times epsilon ij, right? That's the relationship between engineering shear strain and the tensor shear strain. So if you, we want to write a relationship between these two vectors, a 6 by 1 and a 6 by 1 vector, uh, as expected, that relationship uh, is going to be described by some 6 by 6 matrix. Um, so what that will look like, uh, in one case, we'll have sigma, and that's going to be equal to this C matrix, that's 6 by 6, times the strain vector epsilon, right? Or we could write that, that epsilon is equal to the compliance matrix S times the stress vector sigma, okay? We'll call that equation 5. And I'll just remind you that this is a 6 by 6 matrix, and this is a 6 by 6 matrix, okay? Some features about these matrices, uh, we're not going to prove it, but it can be shown that both C and S uh, are symmetric. What does that mean? If That means that its uh, transpose is equal to itself, uh, which means that the only unique terms are from the diagonal, and let's say upwards, so that means that each of these have uh, 21 unique constants. Okay, so just like we said above, that's the minimum or that's the, the maximum number of constants that uh, you would have in a linear elastic um, material if it was fully anisotropic. Okay, so if you want to model something um, with no material symmetries, then all 21 constants are going to be required. Okay, now we're not going to focus uh, in this class at all on that case. And so, in fact, for our purposes, we're only going to consider anisotropic materials that are um, orthotropic or, or, or have even more symmetries and are simpler than that. Okay? Okay? And if you're trying to think what is an orthotropic material, a classic example is actually a woven material um, that's going to be have, let's say, one set of properties in one direction of the weave, uh, one set in another direction in the opposite orthogonal direction of the weave, and then of course one set of properties through the weave thickness, right? That would be an example of an orthotropic material. So in the case of an orthotropic material, uh, it can be defined with nine constants, essentially thinking about uh, properties in each of three orthogonal directions. Okay, and those nine constants are going to be uh, E1, E2, E3. These are just conventional stiffness values, uh, effectively Young's moduli in the one, two, and three directions. Then the equivalent shear uh, moduli, which would be G12, G13, 
and G23. And then similar for Poisson's ratio. So we have nu 1, 2, nu 1, 3, and nu 2, 3. Okay? I will say that the coordinate system uh, that the, for these properties um, must be in the direction of material orthogonality. So think about um, if you have a, a plane weave, right? Or a, maybe if you know, look at the grid on your paper, right? If those are the directions of the weave, then you need to align your axes in those directions to define these properties, okay? If we do that, then the compliance matrix can be written as follows. And we'll say here this is S is going to be equal to, and fill this in in a second. Let's give us some room here. So this first term is going to be just 1 over E1. And the next term will be negative nu 1, 2 over E1. Next one will be negative nu 1, 3 over E1. And then 0, 0, 0. Okay, going down, the next term uh, here will be negative. It's symmetric, so we can say nu 1, 2 over E1. Okay, I'll just mention in passing that negative nu 1, 2 over E1 is the same as negative nu 2, 1 over E2. Okay, so if you want to make that equivalence, you can. Um, we'll have 1 over E2 here. We'll have negative nu 2, 3 over E2. And then this is zeros. Okay, similar to going down, this now becomes negative nu um, uh, 1, 3 over E1. Uh, this is negative nu 2, 3 over E2. And this is 1 over E3. And these are also zeros again. Okay? And similarly, going down, these are going to be zeros. So we only have diagonals left. This next diagonal, the four, four term, is going to be 1 over G12 with our convention that we defined. This next term will be 1 over G13. And this final term will be 1 over G23. Okay? So we'll, and these will all be zeros. And then one final row of zeros. And if we want, we can kind of complete our, our bracket here. Try to draw a semi-straight line. I think I'm failing at my straight line. But anyway, you get the idea. Call that equation 6. Okay? Uh, if you want the compliance matrix, or rather, sorry, the stiffness matrix, uh, can just be computed from this compliance matrix via matrix inversion. Okay? And so when we do that, we would say that if we want C... Well, that's just going to be S inverse. Okay? We'll call that equation 7. So if you have an isotropic material and you want to populate that, all of these terms just collapse, right? And you have uh, the E1 is equal to E2 is equal to E3. And we just would call that E that you would have for your isotropic material. And then G12 is the same as G13, right? There's no directional dependence here. And G23, we would just call that G. And then uh, similarly for the Poisson's ratio. Nu12 equals Nu13 equals Nu23. And we would just call that Nu. Okay, let's collectively call these equations 8. The, only th the last thing I want to point out is that um, the compliance matrix and the stiffness matrix don't rotate like tensors. Okay, so um, if you need to rotate, it needs to be done by converting the stress and strain vector. You convert those into tensor form. Uh, you rotate appropriately, and then you have to convert back to vector form. Okay, so that I understand that we didn't uh, derive a lot of this stuff, and I think most of you have seen this before, but I wanted it to be in your notes for this class uh, for when we talk about anisotropic properties, um, you know how to handle them um, and you have the, the, uh, the tools that you need to, to do the computations that are going to come up.